Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to live in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
Let us pray together. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Ezekiel chapters 18 and 25. Ezekiel challenges those who think they cannot change because of what their parents were and did, or who think they cannot reverse their own previous behavior. God insistently invites people to turn and live. A reading from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent, as well as the life of the child, is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? It is not your ways that un are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your, your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The Word of the Lord. Oh, no way. 
The second reading is from Philippians chapter 2. As part of a call for harmony rather than self-seeking, Paul uses a very early Christian hymn that extols the selflessness of Christ in his obedient death on the cross. Christ's selfless perspective is to be the essential perspective we share as the foundation for Christian accord. A reading from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was from the form, in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. God of hope, we come to you this day, weary and worn, complaining and questioning. Listen to the cries of our hearts. Through your word, give us a sign of your presence. By your mercy and grace, give us the courage to serve you and to be a reflection of your love for others. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in your sight, 
O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My friends, grace and peace to you from God the Father Almighty and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The theologian Karl Barth was once believed to have said that one should hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Now the more accurate version of that quote is, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. Over the last several weeks that has been a challenge. So much has happened that it is difficult to prioritize one issue over another. The COVID-19 pandemic, which has claimed over 200,000 lives, natural disasters, and racial justice have dominated the headlines. In this age of social media, everyone is quick with an opinion on just about everything. Facebook, Twitter, email, Instagram, Pinterest, and all kinds of other technology platforms make one question what is worthwhile to hear or what simply adds to the noise. Social justice, when seen through the lens of scripture, demands a focus on society's problems. The spirit cries out for the poor and the marginalized. In our gospel reading from Matthew, we find Jesus entering the temple and the chief priests and the elders of the people ask him, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Before moving on, let's pause for a moment to focus on that word authority. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives this definition for the word authority. The power to give orders or make decisions. The power or the right to direct or control someone or something. In Jesus' time, Israel was under the domination of Rome. It was under the Roman authority that governors were appointed and the temple was allowed to operate so long as it obeyed Roman law and did the emperor's bidding. So when Jesus enters the temple, he is questioned by the chief priests and the elders, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? This scene took place during what we now know as Holy Week, and we need to go back a few verses before this reading to understand these things that Jesus was doing that upset the chief priests and the elders. Matthew's Gospel tells us in verses 13 and 14 that Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus then goes on to heal the blind and the lame who came to him, and leaves to spend the night in Bethany, but he comes back the next day and goes back to the temple to teach, which is when this confrontation takes place. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? What right did Jesus have to interfere in the way things were running? The religious leaders wanted to protect their system. They wanted to maintain the status quo. They didn't want to stir up trouble with Rome, so they became defensive. They saw Jesus as someone who would undermine their authority as leaders of the temple and the people of Jerusalem. But Jesus desired to restore the temple to its proper function. It is written, he tells them, quoting the prophet Isaiah, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Hence the confrontation and the question. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? In order to answer this question, Jesus goes on to tell them a parable. Well, three parables, actually, but you'll hear the other two next week. In the one we hear today, a landowner had two sons and asked them to go work in the vineyard. The first one said he would, or he wouldn't, but did. The other said he would, but did not. So Jesus asks his listeners, which of the two did the will of his father? Well, that's a question perhaps we need to ask ourselves, but we need to ask it in a more personal, more direct way. To what is God calling us, His church, today, and how are we answering that call? Let's go back to that word authority for a moment. If you look at the root word, author, we usually understand it as someone who writes. And I'd like to ask, who has written your life? 
What is your life story? What story does your life have to tell? Who is the authority of our lives or of your life? You see, if we look at what is happening in the church, there are many like the second son. They say they will go, but don't. Much of what we say on Sunday in our confessions, our creed and our prayers is forgotten as soon as we walk out the door if we're worshiping in person or if we're worshiping from home as soon as we turn off the device on which we're watching the service. How do we live out our faith from Monday to Saturday? Theologian Douglas John Hall points out, when one reads the New Testament, two things become readily apparent regarding the church. One, that the church is God's chosen instrument for accomplishing God's mission here on earth, and two, that something seems to have gone terribly wrong with that instrument. Matthew's gospel cuts right to the chase. There is no room for pretense or pretentiousness. The religious leaders seem bent on protecting what goes on inside the temple while ignoring the cries for help and compassion that are taking place on the outside. The primary point of this parable is about having a change in heart, not just about saying or doing the right things. We are called to look outside of ourselves, not turn inward. And again, I, I go back to Karl Barth's comment, interpret newspapers from your Bible. How do we as Christians respond to the cries for racial justice? How do we as Christians provide for the victims of natural disasters? How do we as Christians do our part to stem the rise of incidents of COVID-19? Let me tell you a story. You may have heard the name Robert Gretz, who died this past week at the age of 92. Gretz was a white Lutheran pastor sent to Montgomery, Alabama to serve an African-American congregation back in 1955. Soon after his arrival, Rosa Parks, an African-American woman, was arrested for refusing to give her seat to a white person on a bus. That sparked the Montgomery bus boycott that lasted some 355 days. Black people refused to ride public transportation. They walked or carpooled to wherever they were going. Gretz was one of the organizers who urged parishioners not to board Montgomery's buses and offered them rides to work. For this, Gretz paid a heavy price. His house was bombed, his family was threatened, he was arrested. In his book, A White Preacher's Memoir, Gretz described an incident in which he was arrested and lectured by a deputy sheriff on religion, politics, and patriotism. We like things the way they are here, the deputy said. We don't want anybody trying to change them. A little later, the sheriff himself also lectured him with the following words. I don't see how you can claim to be a Christian and a minister and believe the things that you believe. Unlike Gretz, many of us find ourselves reluctant to wade into controversial topics or speak out against or in favor of a public policy or politician for fear of negative consequences, be it a change in their neighbor's opinion of them loss of status or material possessions. But again I ask, who has the authority of your life? What matters most to you on Sunday morning and the rest of the week? The question of authority is more a question of what is God calling us to do? More specifically, what is God calling us to do as God's people here in this place? Are we faithful to that call? My sisters and brothers in Christ, Faith is not static. Faith is dynamic. Faith is transformational. We can only do God's work when it is God who is at work in us. God's authority keeps us on track. Our humility in accepting God's grace keeps us from acting in pride by which we might seek our own authority over others in God's name. God wants to have authority over our lives and to be the one who guides us the one who demands our obedience, even as God is the one who loves us and showers us with grace. We can't live our lives without submitting to authority. 
but we do have a choice about what authority demands priority in our lives. There are two verses in our psalm reading that could serve as guidance for us. Psalm 25 verses 4 and 5 tells us, Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Jesus offers us a new authority, a one-of-a-kind authority of the most authentic kind offered by God our Creator. And it is all summed up by the words we find in our reading from Philippians, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Consider in what ways you are encouraging or inhibiting God's work in your lives, your household, your congregation, your communities, and the world. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? We cannot separate our belief in God from the action and demands. God is faithful in word and deed, and that is the faith to which we are called. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the Church, the world, and all those in need. 
In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged, so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, especially the homebound, Ray, Christine, Pat, Maybeth, Marilyn, Janine, Terry and Mary Lou, Joanne, Marge, Kelly, Dorothy, Judy, and Rosella. For all who are facing coronavirus and those receiving care from Stephen Ministers and those we now name, either silently or aloud. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in the baptismal anniversary of Pat May. We thank you for the youth in this congregation and community, especially today for Landon Compizzi. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet, nourish us with his rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. We had a good turnout at our special congregational meeting last Sunday and affirmed a call to Pastor Sarah Taylor to become Trinity's next pastor. Pastor Taylor has accepted Trinity's call. A start date has not yet been determined as we are waiting for forms to move between Ohio and Minnesota. When we have that, when we have that information, we will share it with you. Please watch the This Week at Trinity emails for updates. Fall has officially arrived, and that's the traditional start of many church programs and ministry efforts. During this ongoing pandemic-caused interruption to most of our lives, what those programs and ministries look like will be quite different. We need you to share your ideas and offers of help as we make plans in an ongoing fashion. Please contact the church or any of our council or committee members to share ideas of your willingness to be part of these efforts. This year's confirmation class will meet this coming Sunday, October 4th at 1130 for our next Zoom-based instruction time. Sign-in information will be forwarded to the parents of our students. Our FaceTime group continues to meet on Tuesdays at 1030 in the Picnic Pavilion at Trinity as long as the weather allows. You are welcome to join this gathering. Bring your own chair and your own coffee or tea to drink. I am off most of this week, but will be in the office on Thursday and I'm available for appointments. You can contact me via my cell phone or email, or if you don't know that number or address, contact Sandy in the church office and she can give them to you. Finally, Next Sunday, October 4th, is the day the church commemorates St. Francis of Assisi, who is in part remembered for his humble appreciation of all creation and for all things living. One tradition on that day is to give thanks for the animals of the earth, especially those we have made part of our families. So next Sunday, we will include a blessing of the animals at the end of both our online and outdoor services and you are invited to bring your pet to worship with you or gather your pet with you at home if you are worshiping with us online. If your pet would not appreciate the opportunity and honor of being among us all, you may also just bring a picture or a favorite toy as a stand-in on Sunday. May you have a blessed week filled with grace, loving service, and God sightings. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ fill you with every spiritual blessing. Amen. May the God of faithfulness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.